We're back. So let's continue with spring feasts in the New Testament. Let's jump right in. But you may have heard the early church did not keep the feasts. So why should we, right? Well, that is a false statement to begin with. The early church kept the feasts. Here's the history to prove it. Now we just picked out a few good ones from Polycrates. Letter to Victor, Bishop of Rome. And this is quoted in Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History. About 235 AD, before the Catholic Church, and 150 years or so after the Apostles. What are they doing? They're still keeping the feasts. Therefore, we keep the day undeviatingly, neither adding nor taking away, for in Asia Minor great luminaries sleep, and they will rise on the day of the coming of the Lord, when he shall come with glory from heaven and seek out all the saints. In other words, they're going to be keeping the feast all the way until the day of final judgment. Gee, could that be because that's when Messiah said we're supposed to do? Yeah, exactly. Now, they then go out and they'll say, Such were the apostle Philip. There is also John, who lay on the Lord's breast. And there is also Polycarp at Smyrna, both bishop and martyr. And Thracius, both bishop and martyr. From Eumenia, also Sigaris, Papyrus, and Melita. All of these kept the 14th day of the Passover. That's the biblical Passover according to the gospel. Never swerving, but following according to the rule of the faith. Wow. So, did the early church keep the feasts? You better believe they did. But let's go through some more. Apollinaris, from the book concerning Passover, he lived about 100 A.D., just after the apostles. There are then some who, through ignorance, raise disputes about these things. Though their conduct is pardonable, for ignorance is no subject to blame, it rather needs further instruction. And say that on the 14th day the Lord ate the lamb with the disciples, and that on the great day of the feast of unleavened bread, he himself suffered. And they quote, Matthew is speaking in accordance with their view. Wherefore, their opinion is contrary to the law, and the gospel seemed to be at variance with them. The 14th day, the true Passover of the Lord, Yahuwah, or Yahusha actually, Nisan, or really Abib, 14. See, the early church was well aware, and you can even see the debate raged for about 200 years. And then, instead, pagan holidays were chosen to replace Yahuwah's feasts, which were then abandoned. What do I mean by pagan feasts? Here's an example. So what were the feasts traded for? Well, did Messiah say to trade them? No. Did the apostles trade them or say to trade them? No. They all kept them. And we showed you other early churches who also kept them. Now this is from Tertullian, writing about idolatry. About 155 AD, so about 60 or so years after the last apostle died. By us, who are strangers to Sabbaths and new moons and festivals, once acceptable to God. Now, how did they become strangers to the biblical feasts? Well, the Catholic Church abandoned them and rooted them out with force eventually. But even then, there were some already starting to abandon the feasts. We don't argue with that. But that doesn't make it right. Because again, Messiah and the apostles have precedence. They had authority. These guys don't. Sorry not to change scripture ever. The Saturnalia. Now, today we call that Christmas. We'll discuss that further. It was well known for orgies 
and massive crime, just as Christmas was even in the 1700s, which is why it was banned and outlawed in the U.S. for the first 200 years since the pilgrims migrated there. Imagine that. The feasts of January, the Brumalia and the Matronalia. Now, you may be familiar with the Black Nazarene and Three Kings Day, for instance, the January festivals. Just lipstick on a pig, folks, that's all. That's all this is, and they didn't even hide it very well, frankly. Are now frequented. Gifts are carried to and fro. Christmas, yep. New Year's Day, yep, that too. Presents are made within, and sports. Ooh, you mean like the Super Bowl? Is that why that's that time of year? Hmm, ouch. No wonder it has become a showcase for the occult, and it is steeped in these occult practices. And banquets are celebrated with uproar. Christmas season full of banquets all the time, everywhere. Oh, how much more faithful are the heathen to their religion? See, these are all heathen, pagan holidays who take special care to adopt no solemnity from the Christians. Tertullian says those are all pagan holidays. So why do we not know this today? Eusinius records this, but we just are not taught these things, mostly. At that time, no small controversy arose because all the dioceses of Asia thought it right, as though by more ancient tradition to observe for the feast of the Savior's Passover, the 14th day of the moon, really month, on which the Jews, really Yahudim, there is no word Jews in all of Scripture, doesn't exist, can't exist in ancient Hebrew at all, nor Greek, nor Aramaic, nor Latin, nor Old French, Old German, or Old English, none of them, it is a fraudulent work, had been commanded to kill the Lamb. This is about 235 AD, and the Asian Ecclesia was still keeping the feasts. Anyone saying the early church switched it is wrong. It did happen, but that was later, mostly when the Roman Catholic Church took complete power. It was not the apostles that did so. It certainly was not Messiah. Thus, that church never had any such authority to do so. Basically, they're doing what the beast is prophesied to do. Ooh, ouch. Change the times, the seasons, the observances. Sorry, but if it's anti-Bible, it's anti-Christ or anti-Messiah. Eusebius further expands on the debate going on in around 235 AD, all the way until Constantine's antichrist behavior to change the feast, completely replacing them with pagan holidays. That's actually not debatable, not in history. The great question of dispute between the churches of Asia Minor and the rest of Christendom was whether the Paschal Communion, or the Passover, should be celebrated on the 14th of Nisan on the biblical calendar, or on the Sunday of the Resurrection Festival. Now, where's that in Scripture? Nowhere. Passover is the resurrection in Scripture. No resurrection festival. Now, we call that today Easter but it is not. It is not Passover. Without regard to Jewish chronology, timekeeping, the Christians of Asia Minor, appealing to the example of the apostles, John and Philip, see the apostles kept it, even the early church fathers knew this, and to the uniform practice of the church celebrated the Christian Passover, always on the 14th of Nisan. Got that? The Christian Passover. Passover is the biblical Passover, not Easter. Whatever day of the pagan Julian week that might be. So, in other words, it doesn't always fall on Sunday. It could fall on any day of the week because it follows the Hebrew calendar, not the Julian calendar. The Roman church, on the other hand, followed by all the rest of Christendom, celebrated the death of Christ always on Friday and his resurrection on the Sunday following the first full moon after the vernal 
equinox. Ooh, where have we seen that term before? The spring equinox. Well, equinox, that's a, that's a pagan practice that originates with Ishtar, or Easter, worship. That's how you actually pronounce her name. Hmm, imagine that. Because Constantine stepped in, Constantine the Great, as high priest of, well, another religion actually, a Persian religion called Mithraism, also known as Zoroastrianism, the root also of Kabbalah, which is also called Judaism. Ooh, that is fact. And banned the group who was celebrating the biblical feast days. Because, well, that's the Great Commission, right? Go out into all the world and ban and censor at the point of the sword, right? Oh, no. Wait. No, that actually better fits the fruits of Satan, doesn't it? To steal, kill, and destroy. Hmm. Okay, but what about Christmas and Easter? Does the Bible mention these practices? I mean, are they even alluded to? Actually, they are. But some aren't going to like this. Check out what Jeremiah writes over 600 years before Messiah is even born. He addresses the practices associated with Christmas, which are very ancient, actually. Jeremiah 10. Thus saith Yahuwah, learn not the way of the heathen. Oh, wait a minute. We're about to learn the ways of the heathen here. Uh Uh-oh. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. In other words, they watch the stars. Astrology. We deal with that in part 13 of Solomon's Gold series. Astrology is never in scripture. But anyway. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. Wait a minute. A live tree. What would they do with that? The work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. Well, look what they do. They deck it with silver and with gold. Deck the halls with boughs of... Yeah, fa la 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 right? Wrong. Rebuked by Jeremiah. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Uh-oh, this is sounding awfully familiar. Do you know what this is? This is the Christmas tree. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. Of course not, because they're just idols. Unfortunately, that is what they're described at here in this passage. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good, because they can't do anything. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Yahuwah, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. This is the Christmas tree, and the celebration in which it takes place is known today as Christmas. But this has been going on since very ancient times. Jeremiah continues as he calls this Christmas practice brutish and foolish. Don't look at me, he said it and a doctrine of vanities. Ouch. Though known as Saturnalia in Rome, and this really goes back to Babylon, as Nimrod has, in hieroglyphics, what looks like a Christmas tree, even decorated to a degree. And no surprise, what do they place on the top? Well, a six- or eight-pointed star of Ishtar, Istar, Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, the harlot of Babylon. That's all we are going to devote to this pagan feast. You can find lots of material out there on the true origins of Christmas. 119 Ministries especially has a great video. We encourage you to go watch it. Research it and know the truth for yourself. Then there's Easter. We showed you that the passage with Herod was Passover, not Easter. So the Bible does not mention Easter by name, right? Well, actually it does, just not in that passage. But here 
by its actual name. Yes, the ancient goddess, her name, whose son's birth and rebirth occurs on December 25th, in fact. Now that's odd that the two tie together. Yes, they do. For she is worshipped on the spring equinox as the goddess of fertility. Jeremiah also rebukes her as the queen of heaven. Wait a minute. That's not Mary? Nope. It's the ancient goddess who was called such for thousands of years before Mary was ever born. And here you have Jeremiah rebuking her four times, 600 years before Mary was even born. Mary would be disgusted with any association with this harlot of Babylon. Mary was righteous and doesn't deserve to be a part of that worship, nor would she like it. They made cakes or cross buns to her, and they pour drink offerings. Her name is Astar, or Easter, Astarte, Ashtaroth, all the same name. Her name means star, and her symbol is a six or eight pointed star, just like they put on top of the Christmas tree. Now, that's why the practice of Easter includes bunnies and eggs, because bunnies multiply rapidly and chickens lay many eggs, both symbols of fertility of Astar, Easter, the goddess of fertility. When you participate in this day, you are actually mixing worship with the harlot of Babylon. How does Yahuwah feel about that? Well, we actually don't need to guess. Because he tells us. Amos 5. This is harsh language, folks, but this is from Yahuwah himself. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me, the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. This is him talking to Israel, but he's talking to us. He doesn't allow mixing of his feast days, of his worship with any other God. And when you worship on those days, the days of Easter and the days of Christmas, the birth and rebirth of the sun god, her son, he hates and despises it. That's what he says. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, or Molech, that's the name, by the way, of Baal or Baal, which just means Lord. And this may sound familiar to some as Judaism continues this same practice to this day, where they put it into the Bible, even replacing the name of Yahuwah with this name Lord or Baal in Hebrew, because they did not believe in Samaria the pagans, the Samaritans, the replacements of the northern tribes, did not believe in pronouncing the name of their God. Hmm, how about that? And Chuan, your images, the star of your God. What star? You also see that in Judaism. It's either the six or the eight, and both apply, pointed star of Ishtar or Easter which is never in all of Scripture as the star of David. David has no star. Israel had no star in all of Scripture, but this star is rebuked here yet again. Which you made to yourselves. Therefore, that be punishment, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the Lord God or the God of hosts, Yahuwah. In other words, he knows your heart. It's not an excuse, folks. Sorry, I know that hurt us too. When I realized this, I get it. I was celebrating the birth of his enemy as his birthday. 
and the harlot of Babylon's day is his resurrection, when neither is true. And then I was calling him by the wrong name of the wrong God even, and didn't know his ways for many years, and I thought I was serving him. But since I have restored these in my life, not perfectly, but to the best of my ability, our relationship has grown and flourished in ways I could never imagine. And yours will too. However, this will be a stumbling block to that relationship until you deal with it, because he knows your heart, and that's the problem. He tells you he rejects this kind of mixing, and if we continue to practice this, we will be the ones who will be rejected by him. That's how he works. When our heart is truly toward him, we do not make this about ourselves, but about him. And when he tells you he wants you to worship his feasts, and you don't, but continue to observe pagan holidays because they're comfortable, well, he says he hates and rejects that worship. On these days, when we are associated with those days. Ouch. This is exactly why he continued to call the Hebrews stiff-necked. Please do not allow yourself to be placed in that category by Yahuwah. He just wants relationship with you. So we're left with two large questions that we wish to deal with before we move to the next videos in this series. We see Messiah kept the feasts, and not only never said to discontinue them, but the opposite. And then we see the disciples and the early church keeping these feasts. But is there scripture which says these feasts had an expiration date? No, actually the opposite. When these feast days are given to Moses, they are not new, and we'll cover that in more detail. We'll show you the history of their being kept, some since creation itself. But Moses was told to keep these in Leviticus 23. And here's what it says. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Then he says, it shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And then he says, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And then he says, it shall be a statute forever in your generations. <laughs> Can we take a hint here? These are forever. They do not end, especially not at Messiah's death and resurrection, because they continued and all are not even fulfilled for that matter, according to Scripture. Nor, when they are, do we stop keeping them. And last question. To whom does this apply? Is this just for the Jews? Well, not if we read Scripture, and we do. Leviticus 16, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall inflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country, or, okay, one of your own country would be a tribe of Israel, right? Or a stranger that sojourneth among you. Now, who was the sojourner who was among Israel in the time of the Exodus and after that? Gentiles. In other words, the law has always applied to Gentiles alike if they wish to worship Yahuwah. Because his law is his law. He never had one religion for Jews and another religion for those who were Gentiles. Never. That is not new, nor is salvation among the Gentiles new either, because these laws applied to them as well as the blessings, salvation, as well as the curses, all of it. And how about this, Exodus 12, 49. One law shall be to him that is home-born, in other words, a tribe of Israel, from the lineage of Jacob or Israel, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. You're going to see this over and over in Scripture. Over and over. The same law for Hebrews and Gentiles. 
because he is the Lord Yahuwah. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yep, according to scripture, not just once, but many times. And we're going to cover several because we know some need to see many options, so we'll give you several. Leviticus 17, Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Same law applied to both Yahudim, or the children of Israel, and Gentiles. It's over and over and over again in Scripture. We'll cover some more. Again in Leviticus 18 now. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, Israelites, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. This applied to both. Leviticus 19. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you, get this, as one born among you. You See, he's never been a respecter of persons, ever. Has Israel been special to him? Yes. The people of Israel are special because of Abraham. However, so are Gentiles. And don't you forget that. So, but the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am Yahuwah, your God. Numbers 9.14 And if a stranger shall sojourn among you, and will keep the Passover unto Yahuwah, according to the ordinance of the Passover, and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance, one law, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land, Israelites. Numbers 15, 29. This is good. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance. Okay, that's us, folks. We've all been there. Sin born of ignorance. So you didn't know. Maybe you didn't know before this video. We didn't know that we were supposed to keep his feasts, but now we do. And we are all responsible to keep the feasts as we are commanded, even by Paul, because he did as well. Both for him that is born among the children of Israel, Israelites, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them, Gentiles too. So what now? There is no condemnation. This is meant to wake you up, but not condemn you. We have all been there. We have all been deceived by even the changing of Scripture, literally, in modern Bibles, as we showed you, whether alone interpretation. Our job is to prove all things, all of us. Here's the good news, though. We can all repent of this. Repent of not keeping his feasts and start now. Numbers 15, 26. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourneth among them, the Gentiles, seeing all the people were in ignorance. We were all operating in ignorance, but no more. No longer do we have to live in the dark ages which did not end in the Renaissance. They have still tried to keep us in the dark. And if you watch this channel, you have already seen many things restored in Scripture over the past three years. But this is the most precious of all. It is time we all keep the feast and restore His ways. How can we say this 100%? Because Messiah's name is all over these feasts, every one of them. For the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the same time as Passover, is the exact time in which Messiah was crucified.
In fact, he entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan, the exact day the Passover lamb was selected and paraded into town, just as he was. He was slaughtered on the exact day that Passover lamb is slaughtered, and he did that for all of us. Let us not forget that this occurred on Passover and not the day of the ancient goddess of fertility. He was resurrected on first fruits as our first fruits offering among the dead, according to Paul. Wow. And not only did he send his Holy Spirit on Shavuot or Pentecost in Greek, but that is actually, and we will prove this out, at least some in these videos. Though if you wish to skip ahead on this, we already have a trilogy called When Was Jesus Born? where we actually prove out the birth date of Messiah on Shavuot, Pentecost. He is completely wrapped up in these days as they are about him. And they tell his story. And we keep them to remember that always. We don't replace them with vain doctrines of men. I mean, have we even thought about what we replace them with? Really? Seriously? There is no separating these feasts as old and passed away because they are just as much a part of the new covenant as they were in the old. That's why the disciples continued to keep them, as did the early church, until they were censored illegally with force by Constantine, the high priest of Mithraism. Compare Catholicism with that religion, and you will find many of its core fundamental practices originate there in Mithraism and not in Scripture at all. Yahusha is our Passover, not just part of it. He is our first fruits offering, not just part of it. He is Passover. Thus, we must keep his feasts and abandon pagan practices in which he is not a part, nor does he wish to be a part of whatsoever. Search your heart on this, and you will know this to be truth. It's time to mature to the meat of the word, and we know you can, and most of you will, especially here in the Philippines where the feasts will be restored. Mark my words. Because they don't come from me, they come from Messiah himself. His ways will be restored in this land. But let's all push for this heavily, not just here, but everywhere. We love you all. Thank you for watching our feast series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell. Like us on our new Facebook at The God Culture, space, hyphen, space, original. And view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah bless all.